Hey, everybody, how are you doing? Um, I hope you can hear me. I've had some technical difficulties, which is why I was a little late getting started. Uh, hopefully you can hear me through my microphone. If you can, somebody give me a thumbs up in the chat or let me know. Um, again, hopefully you are hearing me and I'm sure you are seeing me. My name is Ahmed Dents. Welcome to We Are Listening. This is the first episode for 2022. So I would like to, on behalf of Jacob Kitchen, Director of Arts Engagement at La Jolla Playhouse, and also Director of Arts Engagement and Associate Artistic Director at uh, the Old Globe, Mr. Freedom Bradley Ballantyne, and on behalf of everybody at the Old Globe, La Jolla Playhouse, and San Diego Repertory Theater, let me wish you a happy new year. And uh, I got to call a little bit of an aud audible today because I did have some technical difficulties getting things started. So I'm not going to change the focus, but I'm going to bounce around a little bit. Um, today is the day that we recognize and commemorate Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, of course, his birthday was on Saturday. But of course, this is the day that we um, that we actually uh, commemorate uh, that day nationally. A um, couple of things real quickly before we get started and get into things. Uh, again, please bear with me. Like I said, I had had to make some uh, had to make some audibles here. Um, before we get started, uh, San Diego Rep would like to acknowledge that the Lyceum Theater is built on the traditional lands of the Epi Tipi Kumeyaay Nation. Uh, translated as the people who overlook the ocean from the cliffs. We also want to recognize their neighbors in the region, the Payam Kawicham, the Kawiha, and the Kupun Kupeno. San Diego Rep honors the over 20,000 current tribal members living in the area and elevates local elders past, present, and future. We respectfully acknowledge these community members for their tremendous contributions to our region and thank them for their continued stewardship. Uh, always want to give respect to uh, the tribal leaders and those who are indigenous here in uh, San Diego. Um, again, thank you guys for joining me tonight. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit, uh, as you've been seeing, about the Federal Theater Project, the Negro units, but we're also going to talk a little bit about uh, we're also going to talk a little bit about, of course, about Martin Luther King Jr. Um, you know, today is usually regarded as uh, today is usually regarded as a day of service. It's not really by so many people meant to just take a day off and lounge, but there is some type of service that should be connected with today. And um, that is a little bit of what we're doing here. Um, really quickly talking about Dr. King today. Um, I'm just reminded of uh a time here at San Diego Repertory Theater where we mounted, uh, we did a production of uh, Katori Hall's The Mountaintop. And I remember having a meeting, uh, we were in a meeting with Katori Hall and she talked about the Jesification uh, of Martin Luther King Jr. Many of you have spoken to me about this, uh, have heard this term probably ad nauseum from me. Um, you know, if you grew up in the South, in many black households, you saw uh, on the walls, there was, there was kind of like a Holy Trinity of portraits that would be on a lot of black family walls in the house. And of course that would be Jesus, uh, John F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King Jr. Um, I'm pretty sure these days you could add Barack Obama to, uh, to the trifecta, but, um, you know, uh, when you, the turn to Jesification of Martin Luther King Jr. is something that's very important to me because I feel like, you know, at times we put, we have put people on these pedestals to make us think, that they are superhuman and that we cannot attain to the aspirations or the goals that they were, that they were just so, they were just such a, uh, they were just different type of people and we couldn't attain to that. And what I liked about, uh, what I liked about the mountaintop is that, you know, it kind of, it puts you in this place where you can imagine and bring Martin Luther King Jr. down off of that pedestal, not, not the pedestal he deserves to be on, but as a human being. And again, I think history has a way of freezing, especially a lot of black leaders. History has a way to quote uh, Dr. Carr, um, freezing 
black leaders at a certain place of history. In other words, many of us have frozen Dr. King at the mountaintop speech. We've frozen him at the little black boys and little white girls and all. We we've we've frozen him right there. We've frozen him on. Uh, we've frozen him at being on the uh, balcony, you know, on, on the balcony on at the Lorraine Hotel. We've we've frozen him in these places. And I think, you know, I think that becomes a problem because we don't really understand. I think what people need to get is that Dr. King was not popular. He was not a popular person by any stretch of the mag of the imagination, even um, with a lot of black people. At the time he was alive, he was not popular. People were really not trying to hear what he had to say. And I think when you kind of go back through history and you look at Dr. King and you realize about right around the time when he got killed, um, when he was assassinated, there was a lot of things he was saying that people kind of put out of their memory you know there was his talk where he was talking against the vietnam war and how much we were spending to kill people overseas and he was launching the poor people's campaign and uh you know talking about you know issues such as reparations and money that was owed to black farmers and black homesteaders and those who were trying to get loans and so you know that's one of the things i, I think that we you know we freeze him right there so i want to start off tonight before we get into the federal theater uh, into the uh, federal theater project um, in honor of Dr. King today, I do want to play. Um, I do want to play a quick snippet of one of his speeches that I think really um, embodies what I'm saying right here. Uh, let me get this up on the screen for you. Uh, this is one of those things. If you look on YouTube, it's a great speech. Um, you're gonna, you'll find it. It'll be you could, you could just search under "We're coming to get our check," and that that's a that's a great speech. And I think it's one of the it's one of the speeches people don't understand and never really heard King drop. It's not one of the ones that you probably heard today. You know, in the media today, I'm sure you saw a lot of him marching, and like I said, a lot of "I have a dream" and on the steps of the Washington Monument. Like I'm sure you saw a lot of that stuff today that they throw at you every year when it comes time to commemorate him, but. His speeches against Vietnam are fire. And that's when the real hate for Dr. King started coming after Malcolm X is killed. You know, he, he wrote in his book, like, you know, people, I don't understand why we love King and don't love Malcolm X because, you know, you hear about the famous chickens coming home to roost from Malcolm X about Kennedy dying. But in, in Martin's book, he writes that like, Hey, this came to your doorstep. You guys finally see what happens when it comes to you. He basically said the same thing. And it's among these times when people really, really, they already didn't like him. This is when they really didn't like him. He was a threat. He was a threat to people who had money. He was a threat to the establishment. He was starting to bring people together of different races and economic bounds. And anytime you start bringing people together about their money, anytime you start getting white folks and Mexican folks and black folks on the same page about their money, how the government's cheating them out their money, um you are public enemy number one um let me play this speech really quickly here uh i just want you guys to get a bar of this real quick nobody else can do this for us no this document right can do one. this for us no lincolnian emancipation oh wait a minute wait a minute i'm sorry wait a minute y'all bear with me i told you i gotta i gotta um Bear with me. I had to uh, call Audible today. Uh, hold on just a second. Just a second. Bear with me, y'all. Bear with me. This is what happens when you do stuff live. This is what happens when it's live and you're working it by yourself. This is the type of stuff that happens. Okay, here we go. Let's go. At the very same time that America refused to give the Negro any land, through an act of Congress, our government was giving away millions of acres of land in the West and the Midwest. But not only did they give the land, they built land-grant colleges with government money to teach them how to farm. Not only that, they provided county agents to further their expertise in farming. Not only that, they provided low interest rates in order that they could mechanize their farms. Not only that, but they, many of these people are receiving 
millions of dollars in federal subsidies not to fall, and they're the very people telling the black man that he ought to lift himself by his own bootstraps. This is what we are faced with, and this is the reality. Now, when we come to Washington in this campaign, we are coming to get our check. So yeah, that is a snippet of one of my uh, favorite favorite Martin Luther King Jr. speeches just at the end right there. Yeah, we're coming to get our check. But again, he breaks down what was happening with the land, how the loans are being given out. You need to understand when you're looking back at this time, when those loans were given out, you know, when you're looking at things that were happening back in those days, even things that were happening back in the 30s, 40s and 50s, you need to understand the loans that were going out, even if it's through redlining, redistricting, whatever, those loans that were going out to people, those loans who were, be give, who were being given to whoever was favorite, favorited at that time, those white people, whatever, you need to remember that it wasn't just like black people weren't getting the money. It wasn't that just black people of color weren't getting the money, weren't getting the loans, weren't getting the subsidies. You need to, that their schools were being closed. It wasn't just that. You need to understand that was money that those people were paying into the system. So in other words, that was tax money that black people and other people of color were paying into the system. That was their tax money. That was, Those were the fees they were paying and were not. So it wasn't just the fact that like, oh, we're not going to give you any money. That was money that we were paying into the system that we weren't getting. And so, you know, when you look at it like that, when you look at school districts that just closed, like, yeah, we're just closing the school districts so these black kids can't go to school. Those people were paying taxes. So that money was going to all the white neighborhoods. But that was it wasn't just money they weren't getting. That was money off the backs of people who were paying their taxes while their school districts were closed and their kids fell three and four behind years behind and more than that um, in education. So, again, uh, Martin Luther King, we're coming to get our check. Another great speech uh, you can look up on YouTube is Martin Luther King talking about the Vietnam War. Man, 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 talking about the cost of what, just how much it, how much it costs to go to Vietnam and to kill a person versus how much the United States government was paying or was funding, uh, was funding or giving money for poor people back here in the United States. Just, um, just brilliant, brilliant, brilliant brilliant stuff um okay so let's get into it we're gonna come back i got some more king stuff we're gonna talk about in a little bit let's go ahead and brush over tonight i'm not gonna keep you too long like i said i got to call it audible i had some technical difficulties but we're still gonna talk a little bit about the federal theater project the negro units in the house committee of un-american activities and how that still bears on us in the, how it still affects us here in uh this time that we live in at this moment um, really quickly, want to talk to you, uh, make some announcements about what's going on next week. If I can get back here to the right screen, I need to have. Um, see, this is what happens. I'm just all miscombobulated. So, y'all, please, please bear with me today. I tr trust me when I'm doing this on the solo next time, uh, it'll be much better. And actually, coming up in the next couple of weeks, we actually have a producer that will be working with us. Uh, we are listening, and I'll be able to just concentrate on uh running my mouth and not pushing all these buttons which uh will be really really great uh very quickly want to make sure that you head on over to a couple of websites now now we are listening is produced by san diego repertory theater in partnership with la jolla playhouse and the old globe as you know my co-host Cole kitchen uh director of arts engagement and in-house casting at La Jolla Playhouse and the other part of the three-headed monster, as I like to call us, uh, part of our curation team, Mr. Freedom Bradley Valentine, director of arts engagement and associate artistic director um, at the Old Globe. Uh, just want to tell you to make sure that you head on over to all of our websites. Now, I know I know COVID has got us all twisted up. I know shows are being moved around and camps are moving, not just for reasons of COVID. There are other reasons as well. So it's just a tricky time. Everybody's trying to do the best they can to uh, put some theater on and, and do what we do uh, as an industry and as a community. Uh, again, just want to make sure you head on over to visit sdrep.org 
org. Check out our upcoming season, uh, everything that we got going on. Make sure you check out all of our digital work that we have coming up. A weekend with Pablo Picasso, my man Herbert. This is probably this is probably my favorite play that Herbert has done. I really like what he did with Picasso. Um, uh, we filmed it and you can stream it starting today. That's right. So make sure you head on over to sdrep.org and also make sure you get tickets for our upcoming production of The Great Con. Banging It, a banging new musical. That's what's coming your way from La Jolla Playhouse uh, beginning on March 8th. And then, of course, head on over to the Old Globe and check out all the great stuff that they have coming up. We're all trying to make it work, y'all. We're all trying to make theater uh, get back and and live for y'all and one more thing that i did want to uh also make sure you guys know as i said we are kicking off the year in full gear so tonight we're doing this one to kick off the new year make sure you come back and join us next monday the same bad time same bad channel um i hope it's not copyrighted me saying that uh same bad time same bad channel i'm gonna risk it anyway uh, make sure you come back and join us next week as we welcome gina m jackson she is the founder and executive director of cultural noir uh, <laughs> excuse me performing arts center a lot of y'all know gina um if you don't know her you're gonna get to know her so make sure you come back and join us right here next monday this same spot uh 6 p.m uh same time make sure you come back and join us and again head on over to sdrep.org la jolla playhouse.org and the old globe.org and check out everything that we got um coming up for y'all um y'all i'm all right i got a little bit of cough but i'm good i'm i'm good i'm negative i'm good some i just got a cough so everybody relax and i'm here by myself so i'm good uh <laughs> no these are nervous times um so tonight, the focus was going to be on the Federal Theater Project, and it is still on the, <clears throat> the Federal Theater Project, but I'm going to bounce around a little bit. I think we're at a time in theater that even though, you know, we're, we're dealing with this pandemic, it has not just been the pandemic, <coughs> excuse me, it has not just been the uh, pandemic that <coughs> has given us issues, as you know. Uh, even before the pandemic, we were dealing with the document we see white, white America theater, the the uh, issues of race, equity, uh, diversity, representation have been around since American theater began. Uh, but I think to add upon this with the pandemic, not only with the pandemic, but our reaction to the pandemic, things have changed. People have changed um, the way people want to take in their content has changed the way people want to be treated at work has changed the way people expect to be treated when they're out in public has changed what people want to see on stage has changed there's a lot that has changed and i think right now um i think right now we're dealing with the issue with a lot of people in this industry who i think are slow to pick up on that change and it's going to be hard to see Right now, we're still trying to get we're still trying to get the airplane off the runway. We're still trying to deal with COVID. We're still trying to get back to some sense of normalcy. But <laughs> normalcy is a wrap. Excuse me. Normalcy is a wrap. There's no more normalcy, and there's no more going back to how it was. But in order for us to know what's really going on, we're gonna have to go back and look at some of the things historically that got us where we are, like how. How in an industry that is so about virtuosity and it is so about um, how we express ourselves and is so, <coughs> excuse me, is so about um, is so about representation and narrative. How do we? How are we still at this point to where we're still having these issues with those things? How are we at this point? Where we're still not understanding some of the just basic. <coughs> simple simple uh tenants around these things it's kind of hard to figure out right like it's kind of hard to understand and even though we're coming out of this pandemic still a lot of old habits around still a lot of things when it comes to <clears throat> how we fund things and how we're looking at reaching new audiences you know i think one of the big problems that people have to understand i think a lot of organizations did think and i've been saying this for the last year and a half that 
they're just gonna be able to make a statement and everybody was gonna come running and it was gonna be kumbaya <coughs> and it was gonna be <coughs> excuse me i'm sorry <laughs> it was gonna be all good and that it was just gonna be fine and i think people are realizing like no this takes work this takes work if you have blind spots um it takes work to overcome those it takes work to change your behavior comes work like you're gonna have to get out of what you think and what you thought about life and how you think everything was everything has changed the way money has changed is traded to like again the way people want to be treated at work has changed um when people come to the theater how they want to be treated has changed they want to be safer they <coughs> they want more information <coughs> excuse me all the take a cough drop they want more information they want to make sure that everything is safe and making every sure that everything is safe and everything is good and all these things are met that means there's a whole new realm now of training a whole new realm of staff that you need to bring in just a whole new way of looking at things and so what i want to do tonight is just kind of rewind go back and talk about the federal theater project now some of you are on the lot are this and be like, yeah, I know what the Federal Theater Project is, but I guarantee you a lot of you do not know what the Federal Theater Project was. Federal Theater Project was just that. It was a project that was born out of the Great Depression. Uh, Franklin, Ro Franklin Roosevelt's administration created the Works Progress Administration Federal Theater Project. There was the Federal Jazz Project. There was the Negro Theater Project. Basically, this was part of the New Deal. And out of the depression, kind of like how we how we're coming out of this thing, whatever it is that we're coming out of with what the financial markets are doing and what the Fed has been doing. And we're going into stores now, you're not seeing anything on shelves. There's supply chains are broken. Like our economy is upside down. The world is upside down. And we can keep fooling ourselves and thinking that it's not. It is. The world is upside down. Everything is changing. It's going to keep changing. It's going to keep changing for the next couple of years. Um, the world is upside down. And it's either going to be people who decide they're going to have to change their view to see how things are, or they're just going to try to stick it out and still try to roll how it was. It's not going to happen. Um, let me share my screen real quick. Um, and I'll share with you, I think what I'll do is I'll throw links in the chat if you want to visit some of these, um, some of these, uh, some of these websites that I'm looking at. Um, this is a great website called The Black Past. If any of you watched the um, Sesame Street episode that I did last month, a lot of great information there. Black Past is about African American <laughs> history, global Af African history, <coughs> a lot of history about entertainment. Um, this is, uh, I'm about to actually going to throw this in the chat <coughs> right now. Um, yeah, Federal Theater Project, the Negro unit. So what happened was coming out of, you know, the 1800s, there were actually theater syndicates. And what happened was that there were people who had got themselves to a point as every other point in American history. There were those who were in control of theater. And there were those who were in control of what plays went where and how the market was settled and who were the big theater houses and who went on the road and <clears throat> who went on the show, who went on, the, went on the road, what shows went on the road, what plays went out, all that good stuff. So after the Great Depression, uh, you know, there had to be something, you know, along with everything else to get the economy going. The Federal Theater Project was part of a deal to where it was to get people out of their house. It was to get people off of what was happening with the economy. It was to get people out enjoying themselves. Um, picture houses or movie houses now come on the scene. And it was like comparative at the time. It was like $2.50 to go to theater. $0.25 cents to go watch a movie. Do the math. Um, but this was, you know, this was designed to get people back out in the theater. Not only to get people back out in theater, but it was also designed to get theater workers back to work. It was designed to get artists back working. It was designed to get um, the culture spread. 
Um, it was short lived, as you see in the article, 1935 to 1939. We will talk about why in just a few moments. Um, it's the same thing that always comes back around. <coughs> but <coughs> um, <coughs> the same thing that always comes back around. Uh, so this was set up by, again, uh, Franklin Roosevelt. His wife had a big hand in this. It was put under uh, Halley Flanagan. And the Negro, the, the, the federal theater project, the, the big part of it also was the Negro theater project. And what this was supposed to do was it was supposed to let local theater thrive. It was supposed to get out there and let local theater thrive in different parts of the country. More than even <coughs> more than even have, <coughs> as we think of <coughs> regional. More than what, the cough drop is making it worse. Um, more than even what we think today of regional. It was really more to add a, a cultural aspect to it as well. So it was really to get theater out in the different neighborhoods and different cultures. And the Negro, um, the Negro units were a big part of that. Um and I'm trying to picture that I had uh, that was actually um, that actually is the artwork for this episode. Um, I just want to find it real quick so I can go back to it and show you guys um, the picture that we actually chose for the artwork for this episode is from opening night at Macbeth. Um, let me zoom this for you guys. Opening night, opening night, Macbeth at the Lafayette Theater, um, circa 1930. I don't know, could be 31, 32. It's not really an official date on the tag for this image. Um, but look at that picture. Like this picture right here just blew me away. Cause look at this again. This is opening night. Lafayette Theater, Macbeth, and um, look how happy everybody is to see theater. Look at that sea of black faces. And uh, so the Negro units, this is what they are primarily for. They are primarily to get black theater going and, again, to share the cultural enhancement of it. Like, this is where, um, you know, at, before this, blacks were coming out of vaudeville doing their own thing. You know what I mean? They were coming out of vaudeville putting their own spin on it. Like, we... If you look at black vaudeville and traditional black vaudeville, two completely different things, like not even the same thing. A lot of you guys would look at vaudeville, black vaudeville back in the day, and you wouldn't even, you couldn't even compare it to vaudeville. It's a completely different thing. This is where the Nicholas brothers come out of and Scatman Crothers and, you know, like all these people, this is where this rich thing comes out of. And so um, what Hallie Flanagan and others realized is that there was just this rich, rich creativity among the black creatives and so uh this just spurred all of these shows that you know just look at this the play that electrified harlem again this is macbeth opening night harlem lexington avenue once one like and there was just just page after page and image after image um you'd be amazed at what you can find at the library of congress Right. Like at the Library of Congress, you can go, <laughs> go to their website, <coughs> type in Federal Theater Project, Negro units and what will come up. And this is why right now I'm a big propon proponent of uh, I'm a digital guy. I know we live in a digital world, but I think we have to preserve to some point print programs. Um, you never know when the lights are going to go out. You never know. All it takes is one big solar flare and the lights go off for a while. we got to have a way to preserve things. And if you go to the Library of Congress and just start searching the Negro units, black theaters, um, you will just start coming up with all kinds of images of theater posters, of pictures of opening nights, um, actors, playbills. Like you will just come up with all kinds of stuff. And in fact, let's see, let's... Uh, I want to get to where you guys can see some stuff like I'm talking about right now. Let's just do. Uh, 
Let's just look up the Negro unit very quickly and see what we got. So, yeah, I mean, look at all these WPA Federal Theater Project. Noah, a human Kennedy, WPA Federal Negro Unit presents Macbeth by William Shakespeare. You know, Macbeth, Engine House Number Four. Like, there's just all of these great plays and resources that you can find at the um, at the Library of Congress. And so, um, everything was good, right? Everything was great. The uh, the Federal Theater Project is moving along right on schedule. And, and again, this wasn't just for black theaters, but this was one of the most successful parts of the unit was the Negro units. This was really spreading um, culture and it was really putting black theater creatives to work. It was really letting them spread their wings and come out of tradition that had always been there because all theater is what all theater is all theater began with what tribal leaders shamans griots around the ground around the campfire telling stories right i mean that's where it all begins at and that morphs in the narrative and that morphs in the performance and that morphs in the theater over time and as anything else that gets taken over and it gets uh that gets taken over and it gets colonized right so um, a rich history that is now able maybe to thrive again because of the Negro units and the Federal Theater Project. But then again, maybe not, right? Because what happens is now we start getting into the area of the Red Scare. And the Red Scare is funny to me because we still live under a Red Scare. and it doesn't matter who's doing it. Like you could be, you know, we looked over the last year, Black Lives Matter. If you were a proponent of Black Lives Matter on a certain level, you were a communist or a Marxist. Um, if you didn't go along maybe with the Democratic Party, you were a friend of Russia or a Russian bot. This is not new. This is a play. <clears throat> this is a playbook that's used over and over again by everybody. It is to cause fear. And at the end of the day, that is what takes down the um, that's what takes down the Federal Theater Project. Another great article that I'm going to put in the chat right now is if you have time, please read these articles. They're really great. This is from uh, Rescripted. The American theater is not built from uh, for us. And this is a really extensive article. Like I said, it goes back to, as you see here, theater syndicates um, in the late 1800s. Uh, it goes into the birth of the nonprofit and how really um, that the nonprofit model, while it's understandable, was really built on these companies that were really, you know, if you're looking at the Ford Foundation and these other companies, it was still predicated on, it was still predicated on income. It was still predicated with the Ford Foundation you know, that money was still coming in and basically on how good the Ford Foundation was doing, you know, and, you know, everybody knew that it was going to be hard to ask theaters to stay funded with just ticket sales. And so, but at the same time, that cost theater, that cost theater syndicates and networks um, that will force you to play ball, right? Like they're going to force you to play ball and you're going to have to still to keep your theater running, you're going to have to appeal to those who have the money. So you're going to appeal to those board members that have a lot of money. You're going to, have to appeal to those foundations that have money. You're going to, have to appeal to those subscribers that have a lot of money that are in the upper rung. And so that is going to cause you to have to appeal to those people. So the art is not really as free as it should be. Now, you can appeal and you probably could make up the difference, but people are scared, right? Like who wants to sit there and think about how they're going to reach a new audience, right? And the verse in the Bible, you know, you want to be friends, you have to show yourself friendly, right? But there's fear there. You got used to that money coming in. You got used to those big donors giving you these checks. And so what are you going to do? You're going to cater to them, right? It's a, uh, it's an understandable problem. It's, it's not like it's something that's not understood, but I think we act like we don't. 
I think we act like this is this is, you know, I, I see um Anthony put the the nonprofit industrial complex is sadly still so prevalent. It's so prevalent. It's so prevalent. And we're acting like it's all good. And it's not. And I'm telling you right now, trust me on this. It's going to get worse as we start pulling out of the pandemic. It's going to get worse as we start seeing money not coming from the same places. It's going to get worse when we see people who are going to want, want to be funded by what you do. They're going to be they're going to want to see funding by. How are you helping the community? What are you honestly doing? And there is going to be somewhere of a split. And you have to be ready for that. Like your organizations are going to have to be ready for that. Like I've always said, the easy part, the easiest part, the easiest part was the declarations. The easiest part was the plans. The e- Those were the easiest parts. Those were the easiest parts to say, this is who we are. We're woke. We're good. We're of the people. If you work for the people, you know how hard it is to work for the people. Like, if you really do that type of work, you know how hard that is. And that if your mind has not been there all that time, it's going to take some sacrifices. But who's going to be willing to make those sacrifices? If you need new kind of staff, are you going to be willing to sit there and deal with the lows of planting those new seeds? Because at right now we're at a point where it's time to turn. It's time to turn the garden over. It's time to till. It's time to plant some new seeds. And that's takes work. That takes sweat equity. That takes patience waiting for the new crops to grow. Um, that takes a new way of thinking. Um, that's hard. That's a difficult ask for organizations who have been doing things a certain way for so long. Um, so again, with the birth of the nonprofit, and again, you guys, I really, I'm putting these in these, uh, these articles in the chat. I'm really asking you to check them out. Maybe I'll figure out a way to get a blog page so I can put all these things someplace where you guys can get them at. But this article really goes extensively through, again, the Ford Foundation, the theater syndicates. It talks about the, the the National Endowment for the Arts and how the National Endowment for the Arts is like the only government agency that literally can't lobby for itself. Like the, 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 the National Endowment for the Arts can only lobby for money to keep its infrastructure running. It can't keep up with the budget of what it's for. It can't, it can't keep up with the amount of money that the theater industry is making. So therefore, the theater, if the theater industry is making $8 billion a year, the NEA is still down here somewhere at like something, something million because they can only get as much money as it is for them to cover their operating costs, which is ridiculous. But um, I know Trump had a lot to do with trying to um, take that down. But if you people know politics, this happens over years. Like all these things happen over years. There was somebody before he got in there that could have made the changes to make this thing work. So um, again, just another great article. But uh, let me take you back real quick to the Federal Theater Project. So what happens with the Federal Theater Project, again, let me get back on track here. Here comes the Red Scare. Um, Here comes Martin Dyes, who is the head of the House of Un-American Activities. This is the beginning of McCarthyism. Uh, this is the beginning of really hardcore, the Red Scare. Um, an excellent movie. If you guys have not seen it or have not watched it in a while, um, good night and good luck, Edward R. Murrow. Me as a broadcaster, I love this movie, the integrity that this man had. Um, it really gives you a really good look at what was going on with Edgar R. Murrow and McCarthy. But um, with Martin Dyes, who was the head of the House Committee of Un-American Activities, there was no plan. There was no plan. There was no hiding. There was no, um, what's the word I'm looking There's no shucking and jiving, okay? The House of Un-American Activities. Um, you can get a little bit of this if you watch the Coen Brothers, Hail Caesar, in a funny way. Um, the House of Un-American Activities was unapologetically anything that furthers anything. Anything that furthers the mixing of culture, anything that furthers the education of races, anything that further um, takes any type of people of color and elevates them in any way is communist, like anything. And so this is where you start getting, this is where you start getting actors, writers, you know, um, Actors, writers, directors, singers. This is where they're all now being marched 
for the House of Un-American Activities to testify. And it's just a show. It's just, it's part of my language. It's a shit show. It's just, we're bringing you up here. We're going to railroad you. You're horrible. You're evil. You're a communist. Um, you need to understand that when the Federal Theater Project, especially the Negro Unit, started, who who were the biggest names at that time? We're going to talk about Eugene O'Neill. We're going to talk about Paul Robeson. Paul Robeson, one of probably the greatest Americans that has ever lived. Mr. Paul Robeson, actor, singer, extraordinaire. Like, watch Paul Robeson play Macbeth. Um, but he's traveling the world. He's traveling the world and he's speaking up for people of color. He's speaking up for people who are being marginalized. He's speaking up for people who are being treated badly. Paul Robeson is blacklisted. Um, there was a play at La Jolla Playhouse oh, so many years ago. I can't remember how long it was ago now, but called The Tallest Tree in the Forest. Um, if, that, if you ever catch that anywhere, anyone does it, go see it. It just talked about Paul Robeson. And Paul Robeson was the tallest tree in the forest. He was this man who was just, his presence, his voice, my voice ain't nothing like my, no, my voice is like Bart Simpson compared to Paul Robeson. Like he just exuded just what it was to be a thespian, an activist, a human being, a man. Um, he was just all these things, consummate actor. Uh, he's the one that everybody looks up to. And it's funny, as we talk about, as we look just last week at the passing of Sidney Portier, I'll get back on track, but this is important. Um, Sidney Portier goes on to form a company called First Artists with Steve McQueen and Barbara Streisand. And I, I hope I don't have this wrong. I'll correct myself later. I don't know what the major company was. I don't know if it was Universal, but basically Steve McQueen, Barbara Streisand, Sidney Portier found a theater company called First Artists to where they would get a lower ceiling of money to make movies, but they would have complete artistic control. And that is where you get Uptown Saturday Night and Let's Do It Again and all those movies from Sidney Portier. That, again, they stop Sidney Portier with most of us. They stop him at Lilies in the Field. They stop him at Mr. Tibbs. They never talk about the other stuff that he did. But basically, Sidney Portier was talking about how he was at a meeting to get funding for a movie or, or something like that. And He's at the meeting and he realized they want him to sign this paper. And they want him to sign this paper denouncing Paul Robinson. And it was right then with Sidney. I think this is from his book called This Life. At that moment, he's like, oh, I'm on the list. Sidney Portier was on the list. He was on the list that of being a communist, of, of being subversive, of being um, a traitor, if you will. Um, if you read Richard Wright's Native Son, that theme is constantly through the book with everything going on. You just hear about communism and the Red Scare, and people being afraid to speak their mind and this and that. And um, this is basically what happened with the Federal Theater Project. Um, the Federal Theater Project is, it's, for all intents and purposes, it's scrapped. It's scrapped by the House of Un-American Activities. Um, even, uh, even with Hallie Flanagan, you know, part of her testifying to keep it going, you know, they were trying to hang, you gotta remember you guys, this is, this is the thirties. They were trying to hang a queer label on her because, you know, back then all that stuff just, that kills everything. Um, she testified, she testified valiantly. It didn't matter. And so the federal theater project was scrapped. That means everything else was scrapped. That means the Negro units were scrapped. All that stuff was done and done away for. And the next iteration, when you start getting into the 60s, next iteration of major funding where it comes, that's when you start getting into, into the, uh, you start getting into the formation of nonprofits and this other theater industry, but it takes a while. The people of color are still locked out. They're locked out. And then, you know, it comes one theater over here, the Negro Ensemble. Okay, like this things happen, but it's not in the it's not in the way it should be. It's not in a holistic way. And again, you find government in the way. Government in the way of stopping people of color of excelling at what they do. 
of keeping them from finding the funding, of keeping them from finding the creativity, of keeping them from getting on the same footing with everybody else. Um, I want to play this for you really quick, just so you can get, I don't know if people ever really have watched or read transcripts of these committee hearings. You guys watch this stuff on CNN now. This stuff is garbage. You people ain't doing nothing. This it's probably the first, it's probably the worst thing that ever happened to media was CNN came around and started showing congressmen on the floor because they became stars. And so now, every, <coughs> excuse me, everybody wants to grandstand. <coughs> excuse me. I would like to um, play real quickly, just a couple of minutes. This is Paul Robinson before the House Committee of Un-American Activities. Now, this is in 1956. After this, Paul Robinson's put out of the country. Like him, W.E.B. Du Bois, so many others. They're put out of the country. They're blackballed. They can't act anywhere. They can't sing anywhere. They can't tour once they leave the country, they can't come back into the country. If they go someplace that's friendly with the United States, they're blackballed and blacklisted there. This was literally like, no, we're going to shut you down. And that's the problem with censorship. No matter who you agree with or don't agree with, you can't shut people down. You have to compact people with better ideas. If you can't beat them with a better idea, then your idea is not that good. But um, I'll play this really quickly. Just, just listen to how this was going down. And this dude, Paul Robinson, is just something else. The fifth of Max Jurgen to be cross examined. Could I ask whether this is unanimous vote? This committee has been instructed to perform this very distasteful task. To whom am I talking? You're speaking to the chairman of the committee. Mr. Walters? Yes. The Pennsylvania Walters? That is right. Representative of the Steel Walters? That is right. And the Coal mining workers. That is right. Not United States steel by any chance. Our great That is right. You are the author of the bills that are going to keep all kinds of decent people out of the country. No, only your kind. Colored people like myself. And you would let in the Teutonic Anglo Saxon stock. We are trying to make it easier to get rid of your kind, too. You don't want any colored people to come in. Could I be allowed to read from my statement? Will you just tell this committee, please, while under oath, Mr. Robson, the communists who participated in the preparation of that statement? Oh, please. The reason I am here today, from the mouth of the State Department itself, is I shall not be allowed to travel because I have struggled for the independence of the colonial peoples of Africa. The other reason I am here today, again, from the State Department, and from the record of the Court of Appeals, is that when I am abroad, I speak out against injustices against the Negro people in this land. That is why I'm here. I'm not being tried for what I'm a communist. I'm being tried for fighting for the rights of my people. We're still second-class citizens in this country, in this United States of America. My mother was born in your state. I was a Quaker. My ancestors, in the time of Washington, baked bread for George Washington's troops. When they crossed the Delaware, my father was a slave. I stand here <laughs> for the right of my people to be full citizens in this country. And we are not. We are not in Mississippi. We are not in Montgomery, Alabama. We are not in Washington. We are nowhere. And that is why I am here today. You want to shut up every Negro who has the courage to stand up and fight for the rights of his people, for the rights of workers. And I have been on many a picket line for the steel workers, too. And that is why I'm here today. Would you tell us whether or not you know Thomas W. Young? I the Fifth Amendment. Thomas W. Young is a Negro president of the Guide Publishing Company. I'd like to read you his testimony, quote, Paul Robeson has no moral right to place in jeopardy the welfare of the American Negro to advance a foreign cause. In the eyes of the Negro people, this false prophet is unfaithful to their country, and they repudiate him, close quote. Do you know... The man that said that. I invoke the Fifth Amendment now. Can I read my statement? It is a sad and bitter comment. While you were in Paris in 1949, Mr. Robeson, did you tell an audience the American Negro would never go to war against the Soviet government? May I say that it's slightly out of context. May I explain to you what I did say? I remember this speech very well. 
2,000 students who came from populations that would range to six or 700 million people asking to say in their name that they did not want war. No part of my speech in Paris says 15 million American Negroes would do anything. I said it was my feeling that the American people would struggle for peace. And that has been since underscored by the President of these United States. Now, in passing, I said, Do you know any people who want war? Listen to me. I said it was unthinkable to me that any people could take up arms in the name of a man like Senator Eastman of Mississippi against anybody. Gentlemen, I still say that. This United States government should go to Mississippi and protect my people. That is what it should be. I lay before you, sir, an article. Quote, I am looking for full freedom, unquote, by Bo Robson in The Worker. July 3rd, 1949, quote, I said it was unthinkable that the Negro people of America or elsewhere could be drawn into war with the Soviet Union. I repeat, yet with a hundredfold emphasis, they will not, close quote. And gentlemen, they have not. It is clear that no Americans are going to go to war with the Soviet Union. While you were in Stockholm, did you make a little speech? I made all kinds of speeches. Let me read you a quotation. Let me listen. Do so, please. I am a lawyer. It would be a revelation if you would listen to counsel. In good company, I usually listen. But you know, people wander around in such fancy places. You said, Mr. Rosen, and I quote, I belong to the American resistance movement, which fights against American imperialism. Just as the resistance movement fought against Hitler. Just like those that were Douglas and Harriet Tubman were underground railroaders and fighting for our freedom, you bet your life. I have your insist- Man, come on. <laughs> <coughs> come on. That's Paul Rosen. <coughs> Paul Rosen. Like I said, he's on Mount Rushmore. Probably one of the greatest actors in this country, no doubt. Probably the greatest actor slash activist that this country has seen. And probably not this country because as you heard him, he carried this message all around the world. And as we know, no good deed goes unpunished when it comes to American imperialism or um, colonialism. Um, yeah. So... I just wanted to make you aware, if you weren't aware, of the history. And like I said, this is not like, I might have to do this in bits and pieces to take a, a, a deep dive. I just thought that today would be a good day to kind of briefly get into this. And for people who didn't know about the, the Federal Theater Project, um, didn't know about the Federal Jazz Project, the Negro units, again, Library of Congress, if you go to the Library of Congress, um, you'll see so much stuff there. Like it's there. No one's gonna tell you. You gotta find this stuff on your own. You gotta be interested in this. No one's gonna point the way. I guess I am right now. But you gotta be interested in this to care. Like if you really start digging into this, you will understand so much more. And these things carry weight until uh, to where we go today. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> people might not want to hear this but these are the foundings of you know this is the founding of tcg and you know american theater these are the foundings of these you know companies and and networks you know you look at here orson wells if you haven't watched citizen kane like yeah i mean there's plenty of movies about orson wells but go watch citizen kane <laughs> watch Orson Welles who made the movie. Orson Welles was just he was in this. He was he was um he was instrumental in making sure that the 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 Negro units carry forward. Who was he battling with? He's battling with the media magnet, William Randolph Hearst. So I mean, again, here it is, another picture <laughs> opening night <coughs> of um Opening night of Macbeth, and in fact, that just showed me right there. I was looking to where you could really find this at the Library of Congress. Like I said, I had I had things ready to go, but I had some uh, problems getting things started. Federal Theater Project Collection at the Library of Congress. If you go there, 
yeah, you'll get everything. Administrative documents to play, like articles, essays. You'll get everything. I throw this in the chat right now as well, so you can come back to it. Um, and my throat is telling me that's enough, and then I'm done. Um, thank you guys for joining me tonight. Um, I'm getting ready to wrap things up, but please, if you have time within the next, you know, whenever, you know, really take the time be a geek like myself and just you know dive into this stuff it's all here there's play scripts there's everything there's all kinds of stuff here about the federal theater project and like i said it's not just about black artists like there's so much here um that takes us through our history and takes us to understand if you go here if you start back here when you go back into the 1800s late 1800s and you you're like you the questions become crystal clear the the the, the answers to the question let's just point it out let's just call it for what it is that's what i do you're in these rooms and you're tripping you don't understand why it doesn't make sense it doesn't make sense because you don't know it doesn't make sense because you don't know you don't know why black and brown people are so behind in housing because you don't understand redlining. So you don't know. You don't understand racial rent covenant. So you are you don't know because you don't get how that stuff still happens today. And this is my industry. I'm in it. I love it. This is what I do. Um, things need to change. That's why we do it, right? Like things need to change. As you guys know, my story, my dad sat over right over here across the street, sat in that theater lobby for 40 years and head of security and just the, the, the education I got through his eyes of wanting to keep people safe and wanting things to be right um, really informs me. And this, this stuff is a history that you really need to check out. What's up, Monique? I need to have you on here do this because I know you the uh you the expert in all this. I'm just I'm slumming right now. I know you're the expert at doing all this. Um, but this I'm just sharing what I look at every day and the type of things that I see and just what I read and 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 what I do. Um really quickly again, make sure you come back and join us next week. Jacole will be back. We'll be talking to Gina M. Jackson. Please come back for that conversation. That is going to be a really great conversation. And we are working on some spectacular guests as we move into 2022. Um, again, please visit sdrep.org, lahoyaplayhouse.org, theoldglobe.org. Check out everything that each one of our theaters has going on. We Are Listening is produced by San Diego Repertory Theater in partnership with La Jolla Playhouse and the Old Globe. And, um, you know, at any point, during the struggles you're going through, whether it's in this industry or anything else, right? Like it's on us. The strength comes from inside. Like no one's, this is what's that mean? Like work harder. No one's coming to save you. And that sounds rough, but we're born into this. We're born into this universe of the same materials that the suns and the stars and the quasars and the black holes are like, we're all part of this thing. And we're all here to move in different ways of being and ways of knowing and um, times of existence. And so everything we have is here. Like we have everything. Like we got it. If we can quiet the noise, um, if we can quiet the noise, if we can quiet what everybody thinks we should be doing, how we think we should be, what we think we should be, how we think we should think. Um, look, I'm making in this industry. I don't have look. I don't have the fancy letters behind my name. I got a couple. I got a couple of courses here and there in junior college, um, but I make my way through this thing. And so we all have what we need. There's a freedom and there's tools that are in us. And with that, I'm gonna go back to my uh, what I like to call my uncurated king, <laughs> my uncurated Martin Luther King Jr. Um, uh like i said go i can't it's too long go either on youtube or library of congress recordings listen to martin luther king jr's uh vietnam speeches those will really they'll they'll humble you but right now um let's leave on this note 
I want to play you this video of King. Um, just, I'm going to let the words speak for themselves. Just listen to what he says. Be yourself and believe that you're Hold somebody. Campaign. We're coming to get our check. Right here. I come here tonight and plead with you. Believe in yourself and believe that you're somebody. As I said to the group last night, nobody else can do this for us. No document can do this for us. No Lincolnian Emancipation Proclamation can do this for us. No Kennesonian or Johnsonian Civil Rights Bill can do this for us. If the Negro is to be free, he must move down into the inner resources of his own soul and sign with the pen and ink of self-assertive manhood his own emancipation proclamation. It's in you. You got to sign your own emancipation proclamation. No one else has set you free. It's in here. Even if you're locked up, you can be free in here. It's on you. Um, that's a wrap for this week. I'm about to go take care of this throat. Really, y'all, I'm good. People do still get colds. <laughs> I'm good. Um, that's a wrap. Again, make sure you come back. Me, come back, join me and Jacole next week as we welcome Gina M. Jackson to We Are Listening. And this thing will be a whole lot smoother. My man Kevin is coming in to make sure that this thing is run really tight. So we moving on up. Um, have a good night. I hope you guys have a peaceful and uh, prosperous week. And I will see y'all next week right here, 6 o'clock. And we are listening. Have a good one, y'all.